So let's talk about the state of data engineering. And what I really want to do is talk about history because I think that history is going to be repeating itself. And what I really want to do is not repeat the history. So of a disclaimer, I, I, this is the first time I've ever put a disclaimer up, but this is gonna be offensive. But it's gonna be offensive to the people who've done too little and invested too much in something that is going nowhere. But let's fix that, let's talk about that. It turns out, I think we suck mostly as an industry. I think that we've, we'll talk about it in just a second, but this is pretty bad. It actually keeps me up. I think way too much about this. And let me count the ways in which we suck. So one is we have pretty high personnel costs. We're, uh, we're usually a premium above software engineer. We have, we're, we're pretty hard to find usually. Uh, there's high operating costs, where if you're a company just doing some web stuff, oh, you can turn those, uh, you can downscale that web server, you can do lots of things like that, but our operating costs are pretty high. It's pretty bad, actually. So we also have probably the killer to this, these high operating costs, it, we actually have low success rates. This is a pretty big problem because our low success rates are actually one of the biggest problems. Our success rates are so low where I tell people, hey, are you gonna risk a lot of money on a 15% success rate? Because that's generally what we're at. And even when they are successful, even when there's some modicum of success, we actually generate pretty low amounts of value even when it's happening. So th this is not the recipe for success. This is the opposite of what you want. So if you're thinking about what should I do, Read this list, do the opposite of this and as much as you can. Uh, so high success, generate value. So what's gonna happen next within data engineering? Uh, to do this, I wanna look at history and we're gonna look back into probably the, the previous 10, 20 years and look at history of what happened. We're gonna look at data warehousing and DBAs and we're going to look at the history of data science. And then I think based on those two histories, we can extrapolate out what's going to happen in data engineering if we keep this up. So in the early 2000s or 2010s even, do you remember this? It's seeing these uh, posts and articles saying the DBA and data warehouse is the sexiest job of the 2010s. You saw that? You didn't see that? Uh, I, I'm gonna go back and look because I looked at this up for my talk. You were the DBA and you were, okay. Uh, yes, they were starting to kill. Uh, and so she is exactly right. This is what happened. Uh, it was the sexiest job. And I stood in a group of people who were in college and saying, I'm sorry, but you guys are kind of screwed. You're all coming out and your skills are already not in demand. You're, you're kind of screwed. And I was right, unfortunately. But I didn't want to be right, but I'm telling you this because I, if you can look at this pattern in history, avoid this. So what I tell people is the data warehouse was the no team. And if you ever wanted to get told no by somebody, you went to the data warehouse team. Can you go do this report? No. Can you onboard this data product? No. And this is, this is the problem. They were the no team. And so what happened was I used to think that it was a problem of technology because I was at Cloudera, I'm no longer at Cloudera, and I would think, okay, the problem is that the data, they didn't have, they had Teradata or they had something like that that wasn't technically uh, sophisticated enough or able to scale enough. And what I realized is Teradata is okay. Teradata is still okay. What was the problem was the lack of skill. There was a lack of skill that was happening that was impeding value creation. And so they were telling you no, not necessarily because it was impossible in Teradata or Exadata or whatever data of choice it was, it was a skill problem. They weren't keeping up with trends. They were sticking to one vendor. They knew Oracle Exadata. They knew Teradata. They did not know a millimeter outside of that. And that was the problem. It was a key problem that they were not keeping up with any changes, but was also a big problem was legacy. There was a ton of legacy things that mired them. 
So what would happen is they would get stuck in these Waterloo's, these uh, Napoleon and in, 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 uh, Russia in the winter sort of problems. And they would get stuck there, and they would get stuck there, and they would get stuck there, and never create any value. So these poor designs, these poor legacy problems, created a low business pr value production. So what happens? How many of you, uh, I was having a conversation, how many of you have seen how many data warehouse teams are at a company that has started in the past five years? Seen a data warehouse team in there? I see heads shaking, no. How about in the past 10 years? Have you seen anybody uh, create a company in the past 10 years with a data warehouse team? Addy says maybe, okay. You've seen one, okay. So we're, we're in a room of a, of a decent number of people where we've only heard of one. It's not like you, you probably worked there. It was out of this, my experience, I've heard of one. So we have a problem. We actually have a very specific problem. These companies that are starting have seen the low value production and they're not saying, oh, we should go do that because there was this issue of the companies who started the data warehouse team, they saw company A do it and company B do it, I better do it too. We're gonna see a pattern because the same thing happened with data scientists. In the mid 2010s, there was the data scientist and the data scientist was the sexiest job of the of that time. You probably saw that, that sort of thing. Okay, what happened with the data scientists? So my take on the data scientists is that they're the mistaken four. And the mistakes were actually on two sides. There was the mistaken four team, they, were, they mistook that they were going to be doing data science, not data engineering, okay? They, they, that was a mistake that they thought. They thought, oh, I've got my degree, I'm gonna be doing math and math and math, and then some more math. What it turned out is they were gonna do a lot of data engineering, and we'll talk about that in a sec. And then the companies mistook them for the unicorns that they were made out to be. This person who could do math and applied machine learning and do data engineering and do programming, and that person doesn't exist. Sometimes, but it's very rare. It is very rare. So they were mistaken on two fronts. And so what happened is it, they created these either failed or unproductive AI projects. It, it was, it's, it's pretty bad. Uh, if you ever want to learn about a mi mistaken AI project or a, an AI project that didn't go, well, just go to your friendly data scientist and ask them, did your thing make it to production or did it stay in this research phase continually? Continually, because that code didn't go to production. You couldn't make that model work in production, what have you. So these AI projects, they couldn't get to the next level. So when you saw that 15% that success rate, that was the 15% success rate of, com of models that went to production. That was the key part. It wasn't that they were successful and they could do slideware. Hey, slideware is pretty great. Doesn't work in production. Result? We have a glut of unqualified data scientists. How many of you know a data scientist who is, you don't have to say they're unqualified, but let's just say they're out of work. They're unemployed right now. A lot of hands shaking uh, hands up there. So this is an issue. Okay, so now we've looked at these two things and now we can say, oh, this history sounds kind of familiar because if we don't know about history, we're doomed to repeat this. And here we are repeating it. All right, let's why. Okay, well, because we're already repeating certain parts of this. Any of you ever seen this? I am a database administrator. I'm going to replace everything in my resume and say, I'm a data warehouse engineer now. Okay, this happened. All right, more recently, data analyst. I'm not a data analyst anymore. I am a data scientist. And if you think that this was happening on the person's resume, this happened elsewhere. This happened on entire teams, where entire teams of data analysts were now, I dubbed the data scientist, you are now the sexiest job within that, and you are now cool, thank you. And all of a sudden, this, this, this knowledge came pouring down from heaven of, oh, how, this is how we're gonna do this data science thing. That, that isn't how that happens. This search and replace doesn't work, and yet we're doing it again. Okay, so it is possible to make these switches. I don't wanna 
rain on anybody's parade here, but this is not, it isn't that simple. And you know why we're thinking it's simple? It's because if you look back at who was telling all this simple stuff and who was telling all these companies it was simple, it was data science influencers. And the data science influencers were the dearth of the industry. They told people what they wanted to, to hear. They created this alternate reality that said, it's easy, go to a boot camp. It's easy, I learned pandas over the weekend. It's easy, uh, you just learn a bit of code. All right, so, uh, and then I thought about this. You don't become a thought leader by uh, repeating somebody else's ideas. You become a thought leader by repeating somebody else's ideas and removing any credit from them. And uh, this is my plan in life. This is what I'm going to do. Okay. Don't, don't shake too much, Paige. You're, you're, <laughs> you're my only hope for a steady cam. So here, here's the problem. I, I, I think that we're hitting the same thing, where some of those data science influencers are now data engineering influencers. And you know what happened in between? Search and replace. I'm like, okay, my channel's about data science. I see this data engineering thing. I want to do that. But it's not just the data, uh, the influencers. Uh, a few things to know, Tidal inflation is real. I, I'm, I'm just blown away, and maybe it's me being old and cranky, but people with a senior title, how the hell do you have the senior title? Can you program yourself out of a paper bag? I don't think so. How can you tell me you're a senior engineer? How can you tell me you're a lead engineer? You are not. It, you, I don't care what your title is. I care that you can do these things. And this is, th this is happening. So as you look out in the, in the universe of either people or influencers, there's a high, high degree of title inflation. Or they have this limited experience at just a few companies, where it's kind of weird where somebody will have they did FANG, they did the FANG tour, and now they're out telling you what it is, but hey, um, I was talking to a friend of mine who's done the FANG tour, uh, she's actually qualified, because she's been doing it for a while, and when you know FANG people, the bloom kind of comes off that rose. You know they're, they're good, they're not bad, but to say that they're the elite of the elite is not true. Uh, and plus, some of these uh, FANG places, their titles are different. Data engineer means something different at Google than at most companies. You should know that. Uh, and as a direct result, we have this limited technical experience where I, uh, as I look at some of the people that are out there, they have a limited sort of, you have the same seven years of beginner experience at all of these places. You didn't level up, even though your title leveled up, your experience didn't level up. And this is the problem because now they're guiding the industry or guiding people in their journeys with this beginner sort of thought, and it's, it's really scary to me. It's really scary to me. We also have vendors, can't leave vendors out of this. Uh, they said it was easy. We, <laughs> this is the, the quote you've probably seen. Uh, we didn't start this project because we, we thought it was uh, going to be difficult. We thought it was going to be easy. Well, who told them that it was going to be easy? It was the vendor. Our stuff makes stuff, our, our, if you use our tool, it makes everything easy. Don't worry, it's easy. And this isn't the case. Uh, data engineering is still hard. Don't get me wrong. Okay, so here we are. We're at this current time, we're now at present time. Now data science, or excuse me, data engineering is now the sexiest job, you've seen it. But did any of that history ring too? Did, did, was anybody thinking, oh, that's happening now? Yep, this is exactly what, what's happening now. And so I've come to think of the data engineering team as the confused team. What's a data engineer? How many times have you seen a post about what is a data engineer, or even questions about, am I a data engineer? Are you a data engineer? Uh, I do this thing, does that make me a data engineer? It's kind of difficult. Or what, what does even a data engineer do? I have definitions in my book I have very strong opinions about that, and I have reasons, experience, a lot of experience uh, that backs this up, as well as data that backs this up. But should we have different titles? That's another big question. Should we have the analytics engineer title? Should we have 
uh, ETL developer as a separate title. It's an it's a overall question, but I still think that data engineer is the right title for the, the, the sort of tasks that I'm talking about. I think it's important. The other thing is how technical should a data engineer be? I still think that our problem, just like we saw with data engineer, uh, data warehousing, just like we saw with data scientists, a lack of technical expertise is going to be the pass or fail to this. You can't replace this with a technology, you can't replace this with something else. We'll talk about this in a second. What is the defining factor is a smart person who can create business value. This is what we need. And that smart person has to be skilled enough to create said value. So we have this happening now. Uh, former data scientist, uh, now I'm out of work, search and replace, I'm now a data engineer, and guess what? Data engineer skills kind of translate, and you might have done data engineering before, but you did air quote data engineering with all due respect, because more than likely you learned how to code out of necessity. There's a big difference between I code and I love to code and I have a pretty hardcore understanding of this coding and system creation than a data scientist. And this will come up in a second as we'll see. So, I'm worried that the result of, our, uh, of this is the same as before. Glut, 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 glut of unqualified people. I'm, I'm genuinely, genuinely worried about this because this will be how our industry fails. It will be a bunch of people, thank you Juan, who is saying yes, uh, this is how our industry fails. It will be a bunch of unqualified people where we hired this, this data engineer, they don't do anything, I don't understand why, and this is what will happen. And then we think, okay, let's have Gen AI. Uh, this is going to make us, this is gonna save us. I don't think so. I think it's going to make your senior engineers more productive. I'm worried about our junior engineers, where we just say, all right, don't need junior engineers anymore. And so there's no, never this ability for them to level and get better. They just, uh, I don't know, go off into the ether. So. Here's why I think generative AI is difficult. It's because business expect 100% of the things that they can ever dream up to work with 100% of the use cases with 100% accuracy. And Gen AI does not do this. And it may eventually become that, that route. This may be in 10 years, this may be five years. But as of this point in time, this 100% uh, of things just doesn't happen. So. What I found is that it works in very specific use cases sometimes. We still need people, we still need senior people. So if a lot of times people will, will find out I'm in this industry and they'll say, what should my kid do? What should, what should happen? What should I do? And I think it's, we'll always need smart people. And I think engineers are a different level of smart. I've come to think about that where an engineer isn't just smart. You can't say, it's not Jeopardy, where I can say, what's the capital of the United States? And you say, it's Washington, D.C. It's that you can create a difficult value, you can solve a problem with code and create value. And that is a whole value chain, a whole difference in what people do. So if you as an individual can do this, you can figure out a problem, understand that problem well enough, you can create uh, a solution to that, and that solution generates business value, you will always have a place, in my opinion, in some business. So let's talk about this. I've, I'm, I wanna share years of leading teams, Zeta teams, and say, okay, well, what can we do? So how many of you ever heard the saying, or uh, data scientists say, I spend 80% of my time uh, working on data engineering. Raise your hands, lots of hands, okay. Well, you've heard me say, if you've ever been to one of my talks before, you've heard me say, don't have your data scientists do data engineering. But I wanna visualize it a different way. So there in the top left, let's imagine a data engineer. Let's say they're 10% efficient, or 90% efficient, 10% inefficient at a task. And that's shown with there with the pie chart on the top left. So that inefficiency is red, okay? Then we see this theoretical data scientist there on the bottom left. And that theoretical bottoms, bottom data scientist is 100% efficient. 
there's that 20% of data science tasks they are efficient at, and then there's that 100% data engineering tasks that they're efficient at. And the reality is they're on the right, and the reality has a lot of red in it. So my experience is that data scientists spending 80% of their time but being 20% efficient at the task in general, this is what that looks like. You actually have a person who is a third employed, okay? Now go back to your team and go back to your management or if you're CXO, show them this and say, this is what it looks like. This is why we are failing as a team. This is why we are failing as an industry is we're having data scientists basically work a third time. This is incredibly inefficient. This is how we fail as an industry. This is why we need data engineers, qualified data engineers like on the top right. You want your team to work 20% more efficient? Have your data scientists do data science. Have data engineers do data engineering. Get your ratios right. Uh, another concept is optionality. Uh, this is, came from Do Dave Thomas. If you're having to choose between two options, choose the one that gives you the most options. Whether this is in engineering or in life, choose the path that gives you the most options to either go back and change that again, change that later, but impor it's important to think about your optionality. Uh, don't overgeneralize. You're gonna hear a lot of things at this conference, at this, uh, in general, you're gonna learn about a lot of technologies. What, one of the problems I find in our industry, especially with new beginners, is an overgeneralization. Everything has to be Kafka. Everything has to be a microservice. Everything has to be whatever the thing du jour is. And this overgeneralization makes it a rule in our mind and it says, okay, Kafka is the next big thing, everything is Kafka. When the reality is Kafka is good at certain things and is terrible at other things, and if, you have to, and if you're saying and mandating this, you are gonna have problems. Don't overgeneralize, this is a rookie mistake. Quit solving, solve problems. You know what, if, if you can move data from a database into Kafka and you're writing your own code for that, why are you doing that? Use Kafka Connect. It does it just fine. There's no reason to do this, no reason to write this code. That is a solved problem. Focus on the unsolved problems within your business, within your company. That's how you generate value, not trying to solve a solved problem. Now I wanna share some things that I've learned from being a consultant for a while and being a creator. I create stuff. I create a bunch of content. Okay, <laughs> talk to the business. And for that, I'm going to invite my new friend Eric up, who is going to help me talk to the business. Uh, I, I realized for a while, thank you, Eric. I realized for a while uh, as well that I would say, talk to the business, talk to the business. And what I realized is that I have never modeled this behavior. And so I, I wanna show you, this is how you talk to the business. So Eric here is going to be the business side, and I'm gonna ask him three questions. Hi, Eric, what do you need? Um, so we can I'm just gonna I'm gonna come to you so that they can hear. Uh, we're also good friends. It's not HR friendly at all. <laughs> um, yeah, so we just got the um, Q3 numbers back, not looking too good. So we're trying to look for areas to cut costs to make sure we meet profitability. And so, what can we do in data engineering for you for that? Uh, I mean, whatever you guys can do to help us understand costs. So uh, we know we have top line revenue numbers, but help us understand SG&A and just what we're spending money on. Okay, so you want us to help you understand those numbers. So what would be the business value if I gave you an, uh, those numbers? Uh, then it gives us options. It gives us ways to kind of look at, okay, are we over budget? Are we under budget on stuff? And start looking at what we can dig into to figure out uh, what ways we can cut, look for efficiencies or make process improvements. And so if you were to uh, identify an actual numeric value, would that save you a million dollars a year? Would that save you $500,000 a year? So we're looking at about a $5 million target for cost savings. So I think the, the ability to hit that number um, is kind of the value we're looking to pr provide. Okay, so $5 million. So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, this $5 million actually sounds pretty good because if you said 500000 I would say, hey, uh, that, that's probably, is there a way we can change that? Because now I'm going to be thinking about the effort. So how often do you need that data to be updated? If we can get that as quickly as possible, I mean, I've heard about this thing called real time. So 
If you can give me real-time data, it sounds great to me. Okay, and so what would be the value? So let's say it updated once every hour versus in real time. What would be the business value between those two? Uh, I'm just a very curious person, so I just need to know how, as quickly as possible how I can get this information so I can report back to my leader. Okay, so if you were to tell them what data that was an hour old versus data that was milliseconds old, do you think that would make a, ch a difference there? I guess not. I, I guess it's. I guess. I guess I can take it. I can deal with that. Okay. So you see that? So I identified <laughs> what I needed. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, here, have some chocolates. So did did you? Uh, so you saw that. So what I did is I pushed back on on the real time. I knew that. Did I? I didn't know. So sometimes in these talks, people will say, well, how do you know what the business wants? And I say, you talk to them. You ask them these questions. And so this is the, this is the, uh, the behavior I'm trying to model. I want you all to start thinking about it in these terms. And it's interesting, I, I had lunch with Dave Thomas. He's one of the signers of the Agile Manifesto. And he said, I used to, I, this title originally said, this was, this was a rule that was in the manifesto. And he said, no, it's a value because values are actually stronger than a rule and will apply in more cases. Because there are two things in the Agile Manifesto that we weren't doing. We were not valuing individuals and interactions over processes and tools. We were saying, oh, somebody else will do that, or we'll put Flink in there, or we'll put Spark, we'll do self-service, instead of that individual interaction that I had with Aaron. And then we had our customer collaboration over contract negotiation. I can, if I were to do that project, uh, we, we would be able to do that. I would be able to interact with him and we would be able to say, here's, instead of me saying, okay, let's negotiate this over, over email, by doing that in real time, face to face, we can do that significantly faster. I have one more ask for all of you. And that is, um, I, last night I was having uh, at, at the speaker's dinner and I was talking about my talk and they said, Jesse, you need even more call to action. And so this is my other call to action. This is something I personally have been doing and now I'm asking all of you to do the same. I want you to learn more, learn upskill, but I want you to mentor others. I want you to pass on your knowledge. I have personally, I've been passing on my knowledge. I have shows, I write a lot of blogs, and I give it away for free. I have a show called All Done Unapologetically Technical. It is deeply technical, and I want people to be able to go on that show and actually level up, because I'm not talking about bland pleasantries. I'm not talking about high-level things. We're going deep technically. We're talking about two-phase commits. We're talking about uh, deep interactions and how these things work, and we're talking about uh, CQRS. We're going deep into this, and I want this to be out there. And so I implore all of you to mentor those people who are less uh, technically adept uh, than you, because this is how we're going to get out of this spiral. Thank you. So I, I don't know how much time we have for questions. Uh, fire away. Go ahead. So you talked about spending a lot of real 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 time. Um, I guess that's a little bit separate from the book. How do you conclude you know, like the basic things to say I need those? I will correct you. I did not say to split them out. If you read my book, you'll actually see that I talk about both modalities, but it's a it's an important part of maturity. So if you have uh, them, so sometimes they'll put data engineers and data scientists in business units, and what will happen is the best practices will just go awry. They'll just go crazy, go off the rails. So in those sort of situations when they're nascent, when they're new, I usually say bring them together and then maybe dotted line, but you're completely right. This, uh, how do we get the data scientists and data engineers working together is a big part of what I do, and it's, uh, if you see my book, you'll see that there's this big line that said, we need a high bandwidth connection between these two teams. And these teams, uh, how do you create that high bandwidth connection can be in uh, perhaps data ops 
perhaps in the same team, perhaps uh, vertically aligned teams or something like that. But I'm not saying to separate the two. I'm saying clearly, I really want to be clear that the two teams need to work together, that these skills do not exist in any single person. What you have to have is you have to have those perks people work together. Does that answer your question? Yes, yeah, yeah, it, that, that person usually doesn't exist, that, that unicorn doesn't exist in one person, so you have to accept that and get two people to work well together. Go ahead. Ratios? Yeah. So there's a there's a post that I wrote. Uh, it's uh, it was posted on O'Reilly, and, and I talk about the ratio, and I talk about it in data teams as well. I recommend between a two to five data engineer to data scientist ratio. So usually there's an inversion there of lots of data scientists to one data engineer, and that's when you get that, that slide that I had up a bit ago of the, you, you have this when there aren't enough data scientists. Your ratio is out of whack and on the, t on the right over there. Not enough data engineers. Yeah, you have too, too many data scientists, not enough data engineers. So what will happen is the data, data scientists will try to do what they're doing. So that two to five ratio, um, so w the reason that I give that as pretty broad is how difficult is your domain knowledge there? Because your domain and legacy knowledge can be, you might work at a bank, uh, that's really high domain knowledge. You might be in some so sort of social media, perhaps some startup, maybe you could go down to a one-to-one -one ratio, but it is not a five data scientist to one data engineer ratio. That's how you get into a lot of trouble. Uh, uh, one. So, from your perspective, it's just clear. You know where these companies are, right? Like, you just know where they are, right? You can figure out where these companies are doing things, where they're trying things, and all that. And that's really from where the company is at, where the company is doing things, and how they're trying to do things. As for where the company is going in the future, what do you know? Like, how are you communicating with the new team members and what questions are those team members asking? How can you make those decisions? Where do you Uh, Roy, are you in the room still? I don't know if Roy, Roy and I were having, a, Roy Hassan and I were having a conversation on Twitter about this and he says, he thinks it's the data engineering manager's job to do this. I disagree because, uh, but you're completely right. Uh, he was talking about how the, the issue, one of the core issues for data engineers is the interpersonal soft skills, the introverts. And bluntly, we have to come out of our shells if we're going to, to do this right. I don't think that we can have these intermediaries. These intermediaries uh, either aren't technical enough or they, they won't be able to ask that question. So that intermediary, that knowledge person, would they know to ask the difference or understand the difference between real time and batch? Perhaps after a while. I would say yes, but they wouldn't be going to the person implementing. They wouldn't be the person implementing and so they wouldn't have a back of envelope calculation of, oh, it, there's a there's a big significant difference between a real-time implementation versus this. I, I strongly believe that if we can mentor not just in technical things, but we can get our introverts to be better in in, in talking to the. I'm not, I don't think I'm asking for them to be a unicorn. I'm I'm not asking them to be an a hundred percent. I'm asking even if they're doing twenty percent more. Maybe they're, maybe the manager's in that room. Maybe we're mentoring them through this. There's, I would agree with you on this, this All right, it's a good, yeah. good thing you're not in striking distance. I would throw something at you. <laughs> All right, sorry, uh, Chris, go ahead.
Yes. So the, for everybody who couldn't hear what Chris was saying, he was talking about the, the concept of the data product owner, which I, I agree with, that we do need the concept of the data product owner. And until we get that person, or even while that person, I still think that we need the people interacting with direct, in, direct interactions and the intermediaries, the whole intermediaries. Um, we, we need both, I think. I, I think we need that person who can understand it even deeper on the business, and I think that's the data product owner. Uh, I'll come to you in a second, and I'll, but I'll come to him first. So his question was around um, if years of experience, so the difference between a junior and a senior, was relative to their ability to have those interpersonal skills. And we're talking about nerds here where no amount of time is going to, <laughs> to, to change that, frankly. But I think it's about a bit of people getting out of their comfort zone and starting to do this. So uh, what I would say to anybody watching this or anybody sitting here is to say, if you, you want to get ahead and there's a, there's a topping out to your technical skills, if you didn't know that. There's a Pareto to this. You can get to 80% of those technical skills. Getting that long tail, that last 20% is gonna take you far longer. You know what's gonna make you even more valuable? Is to level yourself up in something else that's adjacent to that. Maybe it's in marketing, maybe it's in business, maybe it's in, in product management. But if you do those two things, breadth and depth and I, uh, that may be the, the actual better route than, and, and so to that end, doing something with the interpersonal skills, getting your interpersonal skills up. I, I, I wish I would have known this earlier when I was younger, and that is um, the people that were getting promoted ahead of me weren't technically better than I was. They were just better at either communication, they were better at working with the business. There was a lot of things that they were doing better than me and it wasn't just technical and I wish I would have known that. A uh, gentleman in orange. Yes. So if, if you didn't hear, he's, he, he, he says level up and not just in technical skills, level up in communication skills. Couldn't agree more. So I, I would encourage you all think about this and I, I turned off the notifications and there's a notification. Uh, in, in the back, I, I can't see who you are. Uh, thank you very much. I, I agree. Her, her observation was around valuing the, the, the communication skills uh, as much as the technical skills um, in the middle.
So the, the question is uh, about data engineers and data platform engineers. And that's been an interesting uh, thing where um, I also think it's kind of a personality. Like personally, I love to create. And if I was a da data platform engineer, it, I wouldn't be creating. I wouldn't be creating software. And to me, that would be kind of boring. So, but that's just me. That's my personality of creation. Um, I, I do see them as different. And each, each sort of person I've found has that desire or different desire, but I do see it as different. I see that data engineer as being able to kind of do the whole thing, both choose the architecture, perhaps not be the operator of that, but, uh, but it's, I can see at larger companies that there, there's a value to the economy of scale of having that platform done. We also see this in data mesh being important that we have that platform engineering team. Uh, but but I, for me, there's that gut check of, man, that's not me. I, I want to be creating. And that, but that's not a value judgment on anybody else. Uh, go ahead, Chris. So he was. So Chris was talking about uh, the the gaps with uh, architecture and putting some of those guide rails on, and what I'm wondering is if those guide rails were actually better. Where if we talk to the business and we say and they say, oh, if he had said, okay, it's five million, and if you do it in real time, it's fifty million. Boom. Even if we haven't done real time before, there's enough value behind that to where we start doing that. And I'm wondering if there's such, there's too much disconnect uh, where uh, we look at our, our platform and does, do we have Kafka or not? And we think, oh, we don't have Kafka. I'll, uh, you might have heard the term, we're tripping, over, um, we're tripping over dollars to pick up dimes. That could be one of those times where you're like, oh, we, we don't have Kafka. I'm sorry, I can't make you that extra 45 million. And, or wh whatever technology of choice. So I think it needs to be a little bit of both where the architects uh, are there doing it. I think they're doing a different type of, of uh, guardrail. So when we're talking about those, that overgeneralization here, this is where I want the architects to be saying, don't make rules, don't say everything has to be Kafka. I'm here to tell you don't do stupid things because you're seeing this at a conference talk because somebody told you to do this. I want to press back and I want you to understand, okay, if we actually went down that, that real-time route, what, is, what are the possible problems there? What could, we, what could go wrong there? Why, although let's say there is that 50 million, okay, well, what's our risk? What's the risk of this going wrong? What's the risk of, uh, uh, perhaps that was the question I should have asked him is if you're off by 10 million, what's the uh, in revenue? Is that a big thing or is that a small thing? If we're at a small company and you say we're off by 10 million, wow, that could you could be in all the way in the negatives. If you're at some huge company being off by 10 million, maybe a rounding error. So there are some real important things and that would be where I'd look for the, the architects. Uh, one of the interesting things is I, the only writing I've seen about data architects has been in my data teams book. I haven't really seen anybody else write about it because I've seen two interesting um, uh, trends. And one is that the architects, that the data engineers are being their own architects and they're choosing the technologies. They're not really going through that architecture review board or something like that. Or that the data architect is basically the architect from the tw 20 years ago and they're woefully out of date and not ready to make these decisions. And that's a whole problem unto itself. And you really don't want to be caught there. You, you want to be, 
w you want to be have somebody there to make an adult decision. A friend of mine calls it adult supervision. You need some adult supervision there. You, you have Addie? Yeah, yeah, w that's a much larger one, but it's, I think it comes down to not stopping listening to influencers, listen less to vendors, listen more to what we see in the real world. And, and instead, uh, I forgot to a a ask this, is there are too many questions I see on Reddit saying, what's the minimum? What's the bare minimum I can do to get a job? Instead of saying, what do I need to do? What do I need to learn? How much time do I need to spend to do this right? And with that, I apologize. We need to go, but thank you again so much.